coming up today on Keys to Kingdom Living. God did not say, Asa, you sin, you're going to hell. I'm not going to give you an opportunity to excuse yourself or justify why you did it. You're going to hell. There's no hope for you. No, he did not do that. He sent his son to hell so we don't have to. Someone might argue. What about the bad things, the evil things that are happening to good people? I would argue... Imagine how awful it would be if God didn't protect us from the devil who's doing those things. See, we focus on the bad things and then we want to blame God for what is happening. I want you to hear what the Spirit is saying. Start focusing on how bad it really would be if God was not protecting us right now. Thank you for tuning in to Keys to Kingdom Living. Today we're bringing you a new message. It is entitled, It's Better in the Father's House. There's so much clarity that's going to be brought forth in this word through the Holy Spirit, out of God's word. I don't want you to miss a moment of it. Let's get your Bibles out. Go with me. And let's hear this message. John 14, Jesus says that he has... In his father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, he would have told us. He says, he goes to prepare a place for us that where he is, there we may be also. And in the father's house, there's so many blessings. There is protection. And as I just said, in the father's house is where we're at when we're in Christ Jesus. And it shelters us from the storms of this life. So having said that, look there in Matthew chapter 19. Let's pick it up in verse 16. I thought today would never get here. I'm so excited about what the Lord has for you today. I pray that you've been praying and asking God to prepare your heart for the seed of his word, that it get in on good soil and take root and produce fruit. Verse 16, Now behold, one came to him, Jesus, saying, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And as you read that, you see that this man's focus is on being good. And there's a lot of people that sit in church every Sunday, and they talk about throughout the week their life, and they focus on being good. And it's really not about being good. Yet this religious man, if you will, had an emphasis on being good. And so he comes to the Lord, thinking that him being good would be good enough for eternal life. Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one. That is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. Wow. It's not about being good. It's about keeping the commandments, Jesus said, if you want to have and inherit inter eternal life. Now the word teaches us that Jesus lived a sinless life and he always spoke the truth. There was no deceit or guile found in his mouth. In fact, Jesus came, and he says this in John, to bear witness of the truth, thus establishing God's law and God's word as the truth in the earth. Think about that. He came to bear witness of the truth to establish it as truth so that whoever places their faith in the truth for salvation we will know beyond any doubt that there, our destination is heaven you've got to know you've got to have evidence that this is the truth it is the absolute truth and what it says about heaven about the father's house and eternal life it is truth and we can rest in that since Jesus only spoke truth, we know from his own mouth that there is none good but one, and he said that is God. Now it's worth noting here that Jesus did not include himself in his statement. There's none good but one, and that is God. 
Wow. Jesus, the Son of God, born of the Spirit, firstborn among many brethren, does not include himself in being good. He says there's only one good, and that is God. It's worth noting that. Think about that, y'all. Having established this truth that God is good, there is something in fallen man. Now, I want you to hear what the Spirit is saying to us today. And don't just say, well, this is another sermon. This is a word of God. It's going to bring clarity into your hearts and your lives. And what God is doing is he's revealing by his Spirit his heart so that we can know God's heart. We can know God's ways. And when you know God's ways, then you can walk in those ways and you will be perfect in God's sight. Wow. There's something innate, something in the nature of fallen man that wants us to believe that God is not good. That he isn't just. He isn't holy or righteous. Now, the subject of God's character traits generally crop up whenever humans are faced with devastation like we're seeing today. Nations' economies are reeling because they've shut down everything about business except for essential things, and that's not enough to carry the nations. And so in the time of devastation, it's as though people want to call God's character traits into question and start questioning if he's really good. After all that God did for Adam before Adam sinned against the Lord, and God did a lot, whatever Adam needed, God saw to it in advance, and he provided that for him. He told him where, what to eat. He told him the, the fruit to eat. He told him the fruit to stay away from. He even showed Adam where the good gold was. He knew in advance that it was not good for man to be alone. And he provided Adam a help me and gave him the woman to be with him, to be a help with him so that they could be together. God saw to it that Adam's every need was provided before Adam even needed it. And after all that God had done for Adam, y'all, after Adam sinned, and he became a flawed human being because of his sin. Adam accused God of being flawed himself. When he blamed God for giving him the woman that caused him to sin against God. Now imagine that. It's that woman, God, that you gave me. So in one statement, he is coming against Eve and he's blaming God and he's calling God's character into question. Well, why is wanting, God wanting me to talk about the character of God that, that there is none, no evil in him? Matter of fact, God cannot be tempted with evil, James says, nor does he tempt with evil. That means if the pandemic, the things that are going on that are wrong in this world are causing you to consider sinning, that is not God doing that to you. That is the enemy tempting you with evil. But God has given me this word because in this pandemic, in this down cycle that we're going through, and it's only a season, trials don't last, but faith does, and we've got to get our faith in God. And if we will understand beyond any shadow of a doubt, if Adam, who walked with God, I'm telling you, he walked with God, he experienced God's goodness, he experienced all all that God did for him and when he sinned he turned around and blamed God we've got to get past the place where when things are not going right for us we find fault with God and we want to call his character into question because if we will really believe in our heart of hearts down inside of our knower that God is good then that tells me whatever the enemy meant for evil God is going to take even that and work it together for my good you've got to get this inside of your spirit today that God is good to the core. There is not even a speck of evil inside of him. 
And if you'll get that inside of your spirit, you'll start seeing a light at the end of this dark tunnel. You'll start getting hope inside of your spirit. And you'll start saying, the Lord, He is God. And if God be for me, I'm going to come out of this. And I'm not just going to come out of it. I'm going to come out of it with absolutely everything that the enemy tried to take from me. God is going to see to it that I will be restored. But you've got to believe it in your heart that God is good to the core. Say that with me. My God is good to the core. Since we came into this world as flawed beings, it's almost humanly impossible to believe that God is really good. What? There is always that little gnawing feeling back here. When things are not going right, you start saying, is God really good? I'm talking about in our humanity. It's almost impossible to believe that God is really good. How can God be good and children are dying of starvation in the nations of the world? How can God be good when people are dying of disease? People are dying of coronavirus. How can God be good? And, and there's something in us that wants to accuse God and blame Him. For the evil that's in this world. Not only is God good. He's good to us. That's shouting ground right there. Not only is God good, He's good to us. And not only is He good, not only is He good to us, the Lord will take something that was meant for evil and bring good out from it for us. No weapon formed against you shall be able to prosper because it will be the good God, the Jehovah God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel that will take that weapon and by the time it reaches you, he will have worked that thing together for your good so that it will not prosper in what Satan sent that weapon to do, to do in your life. It will not be accomplished. You've been on the job. You've, you've had your job put up in question because people lied against you. They told lies about you they've accused you of things and you prayed and you saw God says God I know these people they've got the inroad to the boss and if they tell the boss I've did I've done this and I have no way of refuting that because I have no witnesses to counteract it that I did not do it then the Lord has to fight your battle and when you fought the battle through the Lord God turned that situation around and he exposed the lies of the people that were telling the lies on you and God raised you up in the eyes of your employer because God is a good God, and if we'll give God our battles, God will give us His victory. Turn with me to Romans chapter 5. I want to give you scripture to back this up. Because your faith has to be in the Word of God. Not in what man preaches, but what God declares. So whatever I preach, I need to back it up. So that your faith is solid in God's word. Verse 6, Romans 5. For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the who? The ungodly. I hope you got your word out and you're going with me. Christ died for the ungodly. He didn't die for the Pharisees. He didn't die to, to, for religious people. He died for the ungodly, y'all. Because all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. So he died for all. For scarcely for a righteous man one will die, yet perhaps for a good man, there it is again, some would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love. He shows, demonstrates, put out there in front for everybody to see his own love. The type of love that God has, he has demonstrated it. And this is God's love in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's the kind of love that our God has in Christ Jesus. Much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Christ. You need to get that in your spirit because of the blood of Jesus that has been applied to our lives. We as Christians are saved from the wrath of God. 
We're not, people are eat up right now with the, the, the Antichrist, the mark of the beast, and being chipped right now. But I'm going to tell you, we're not appointed under wrath. That will not happen until the great tribulation, and that is in the last three and a half years of life on this earth. And that is when God's wrath is going to be poured out on mankind. So Christians, stop worrying about the mark. We're not appointed under wrath. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God. Did you see that? While I was still an enemy of God, I was being reconciled to God. See, that's, that's God. He saw to it like he did Adam. What Adam needed in advance, he saw to it long before the foundation of the world. What you and I needed was a, a spiritual deliverer named Jesus Christ. And while I was still a sinner, while I was still in my mother's womb, God had already made the provision for my reconciliation and for your reconciliation. Long before I even knew I was a sinner. God has already provided a way of escape for me from damnation. Somebody needs to be praising God in the house right now and let your neighbor hear you praising your God. Much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved. You'll be saved from this by his life. These verses which reveal to us the true heart and true character of God. Moreover, they show us how much God loves sinners. Wow. He can love a lot more than we can his children who have the same spirit in us that's, that God is. He's, he's the God of love. His spirit is in us. And his love's been shed abroad in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. But God can love sinners a lot better than we can as Christians. I'll get into that in a little bit. Pick your feet up off the floor. Instead of condemning us to hell for our sins, he did not condemn us to hell for our sins. Instead, God laid both the curse of sin and the punishment for our sin on his innocent son to avoid sending us to hell for our sins. I want you to think about that. We deserved hell. We have sinned, even since becoming a Christian. You've sinned, have you not? I have. I've had to repent many times. I've fallen short many times. The righteous fall down, but we get back up. But God did not say, hey, so you sinned, you're going to hell. I'm not going to give you an opportunity to excuse yourself or justify why you did it. You're going to hell. There's no hope for you. No, he did not do that. He sent his son to hell, so we don't have to. Someone might argue. What about the bad things, the evil things that are happening to good people? I would argue, imagine how awful it would be if God didn't protect us from the devil who's doing those things. See, we focus on the bad things and then we want to blame God for what is happening. I want you to hear what the Spirit is saying. Start focusing on how bad it really would be if God was not protecting us right now. What is it in us, fallen man, humans, what is in us that wants us to find fault and lay, lay blame at the feet of God when he is the one who allowed his son's blood to be spilled on Calvary to save sinners? No one else has done that, nor could anyone else do that, because Jesus is the only one who lived a sinless life. What is it in us? that wants to find fault and blame God after he's done all that he's done for us. Turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 19. Look there in verse 11 with me. This is after the showdown of Mount Carmel where Elijah has gone up against the prophets of Baal, the false prophets that have been causing the Jews to commit adultery, uh, 
spiritual adultery, idolatry. They've been worshiping Baal instead of their God. And so they've gotten victory and the hearts of the people, the Jews, have turned back to God. And so Elijah has gone into deep depression and God is visiting him in his hour of need. You may be in depression. You may be eat up with anxiety today. God has a word for you. The Lord spoke to Elijah in verse 11 and says, Then he said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And when he passed by, a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. I want you to think about what Elijah just witnessed. Just last week, tornadoes ripped through a lot of Tennessee in different areas. People were killed, destruction. This wind was so powerful, it broke up rocks into pieces. And Elijah is standing there. I don't know what kind or how great or intense that wind had to be to literally break rocks into pieces, but he's witnessing this. And can you imagine that could seeing wind? We see wind that, that blows our shingles off and we go into hysteria. Could you imagine seeing rocks being broken in front of you? How much fear would you have to see rocks being broken into pieces? And Elijah is seeing this after God has passed before him. But the Lord, look at it, y'all. The Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake came. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire erupted. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a small, a still, small voice came and spoke. The purpose of reading the story of Elijah's encounter with the Lord is to establish a spiritual principle. Scripture teaches us that God wasn't in the strong winds. He was not in the earthquake. Are you hearing what the Spirit is saying? He's not in all this stuff that we're blaming God for. He wasn't in the strong winds. He wasn't in the earthquake, nor was he in the fire. But he spoke to Elijah in a small, still voice. See, God's starting to get our attention, and when he can get our attention, he'll start telling us who he is. He said, I will reveal myself to you through my son, Jesus Christ, but you've got to be still. When the Jews were very afraid at the banks of the Red Sea because Pharaoh had pursued them and they were, they were trapped there between the mountains, the Red Sea, and Pharaoh, the Lord told Moses to tell his people, be still. And the Spirit of God is telling me to tell you, God's people, be still. Because God's not in the wind, he's not in the hurricane, he's not in the typhoon, he's not in the earthquake, he's not in the, the, the forest fires that eat up uh, California. He's a, he's a still small voice. Yet God gets blamed for a lot of bad things that happen in the earth. But he's not the author of them, Satan is. So, why is it so easy for people and insurance companies to say that disaster is an act of God? It's the only time you'll generally hear a, a major national insurance company acknowledge God. is when there's earthquake, tornadoes, hurricane, or fires. Isn't that interesting? The things he's not in, that's when people of the world want to say, it's an act of God. Why is it so easy for people to do that, but then turn around and refuse to believe or acknowledge that Satan is the culprit? That's what I want to know. Why is it Satan, looks like Satan would want a little free press. You know what I mean? He's full of himself. So why don't he get on the news and say, wait a minute. God didn't bring that destruction to you. I did. I don't want you to cheat me out of my time. I'm Satan. I'm the God of this world. I did that. 
No, he does not want you to know that he is the author of all of this destruction. He wants you to blame God so you'll turn to him. Ooh, I felt that one. Isaiah 55, 8. It says, Mankind does not know the ways of God, nor do we know God's thoughts. Consequently, people, even good Christians, good, come against God simply because He is in control. Hear what the Spirit is saying, y'all. We come against God in times of devastation because He is in control, but folks don't want Him to control them. They just want Him to be in control of things that affect them adversely, but they don't want Him to control them. So people blame God when calamity or death touches their lives. Instead of turning to God, they blame him. You will remember in Romans 5, the Lord tells us through Paul, we who receive Christ as Savior, we are justified, that means made innocent or right in God's sight, apart from works. And we are saved from the wrath through Jesus Christ. Before I leave you today, I want to encourage you, be sure and check out next week, the same time, same station, the powerful conclusion of this message. There is so much more that God has in store for you to receive into your life that will bring not only clarity, it will show us so much more about the heart of God that we may not even have known. There were things that the Lord taught me. I've been in the Word for over 20 years, studying it, picking it apart. But, you know, Isaiah tells us the wisdom of God is unsearchable. He's always revealing new things to us. And thank God for that because he's revealing his ways and his thoughts to us as his children. Isn't God great? I'm so excited about what he's doing. Even though there's adversity in the world, in Christ there's peace. And I pray that is true for you today. But if you do not have peace about your circumstances and your situation that you're in, would you email us or call us and let us pray with you and for you that the Prince of Peace will come and bring that peace that passes all understanding into your heart and life and into your home and family. Because if God be for us, who or what can be against us? As I get ready to leave you today, I want to encourage you. Will you stand with this ministry, not only prayerfully but financially? Give us an opportunity to reach the nations of the world through the means and the availability that God has given us through several television stations plus the internet that reaches into every nation that has internet. God has given us this platform and we use it solely for the glory and the kingdom of God that his will may be done on earth as it is in heaven. Would you prayerfully consider? Go to our website, whcnorth.org. There you can give safely and securely through PayPal or Givelify. What you give is tax deductible and goes right back in television ministry. And I want to encourage you, whatever you're going through, lift up your eyes, look up. Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. He ever lives to make intercession on your behalf and keep your eyes on him. God bless you.